All right, we're live now. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to all viewers, colleagues, and friends. My name is Magdalene, and I'm a speech language therapist from 20 DB Therapy Training Coaching. And it's a great honor to have you join us tonight. And um, I think we have viewers from Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, we're going to give a few more minutes for more people to come in. And I understand we will have some viewers from other countries as well. So if you are from another country, could you please uh, notify us by typing in the chat box? And also as we go along uh, the session today, please feel free to type in any questions you have and we would do our best to attend to them uh, towards the end of the session. So we're just going to wait for another minute before we start uh, today. Okay, so in conjunction with uh, 20 dB's 18th anniversary, and in collaboration with Speech Therapy Work Singapore, uh, we'd like to share tonight on a very important topic about nasopharyngeal cancer, NTP, and the effect of it uh, on speech, swallowing, and hearing difficulties uh, before, during, and after radiotherapy, why and how to manage. And so today, without further ado, I'd like to welcome and introduce to you uh, my fellow colleague, Mr. Liu Junkok. Junkok, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you, Madeline, and good evening to everyone. My name is Liu Junkok. I have been working at 20 dB Hearing for 17 years as clinical audiologist. I have seen some new MBC patients with hearing loss and provide audiological management to them almost every year. And NPC is the fourth most common cancer now in Malaysia. I hope today's topic will provide more and useful information to you all in related to the speech, swallowing, and hearing difficulties in NPC. Yep. All right. Thank you, Junko. Uh, Junko and I, just for, for um, fun information, that we were actually classmates in uni. And it's really nice to be able to see him in this uh, platform after 17 years. So, and also uh, our next speaker, Mr. Yun Wai Lam, he is our senior from UKM. So this is like a, going to be like a mini uh, uni reunion. And um, Mr. Wai Lam to me is a very inspiring swallowing guru in our region. And he's been um, training speech language therapists in our region in, a very, in pertaining to swallowing assessment and rehabilitation. So without further ado, I, um, Wailam, would you like to come on? Welcome, Wailam. Welcome, Wailam. Hi, everyone. Hi, Madeline. And hi, Junko. Hey, thank hi. you for introducing me. Good evening to all the viewers. Thanks for tuning in. I, um, I have some friends coming um, who are going to view from Indonesia, um, from Nepal, from Bangladesh, India, Taiwan, Japan as well. And um, could be some from USA if let's say they are, they decided to 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 tune in and um, uh, skip their maybe maybe uh, not sleeping. All right. So I'm trying to make I will try to make try to make this um, presentation exciting. So um, all right. So right now we we will we'll start the uh, presentation. So the topic for today. Um, is a topic of interest to many people in Southeast Asia, as well as Asia as well, especially the Chinese um, community, because um, some people actually call it the uh, so-called like the the a cancer that is more related to the Chinese, because um, especially the Cantonese, and I'm Cantonese, so it's um, some uh, uh, an area that really I'm interested in, and uh, I did a lot of research on this area, and. Um, even came up with some of the protocol to do treatment for um for uh, uh patients with NPC. So I will I will start my presentation now. So just a bit of introduction about myself. I'm a senior principal speech therapist and director of uh, speech therapy works LLP. 
Um, I'm a founder of Singapore Swallowing Specialist Network. And this is a network um, that uh, I, I, I do blog and um, provide information about swallowing. So if you're interested, you can actually tune in to, to follow my blog. And uh, I'm also an invited lecturer at NUS Master in Speech Pro, uh, Pathology. And um, I invented the chin tuck again resistant CTA swallowing exercise. The photo, you see me holding a yellow ball. It's actually the CTA exercise. So if you're interested later, I'll give you a, UR, a QR code for you to follow, uh, to get to know more about this exercise. So you can go to my website to take a look. And uh, my website currently is down, the main one. And the dysphagia one is still on. My blog is on uh, dysphagia.sg. You can email me after this or WhatsApp me for more information or for, uh, to ask any questions is fine. But uh, preferably WhatsApp message and I'll try to reply as, as um, soon as I can um, if possible. So if you want to find out more about CTA exercise, you can um, visit my blog or scan this QR code. Don't worry about the QR code now or the, the, the URL because after this presentation, I'm going to put this handout in my blog. So I will give you the link. Then you can download the, the handout from, from my blog, not to worry. So you don't have to take notes or whatever. All right. And we just started one new, new movement called the Global Dysphagia Movement. Ooh, sounds so grand. So this is a movement. The reason why we started this is um, I, I developed a CTA video during the circuit breaker, Singapore circuit breaker. Then the video, I translated to Malay, then posted on some international platform. Then surprisingly, there were a lot of people sent encouraging feedback on uh, the video. So there are many countries, um, speech therapists from different countries, actually uh, um, they are interested to translate the video into their, their languages. So, so it will benefit the people from um, around the world. So I think that's a good idea. So we decided why not we come up with a movement we work together, maybe one video, but many languages. Then when, it, when, then when this can reach out to more people, I think we can create a better awareness in this region. So we have now Singapore, Malaysia, Japan, USA, Taiwan, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Philippines, and hope to have more countries, all right, joining us. So currently, the only thing that you need to do is just email me and express your interest, then I'm going to start one, one page in my blog um, to, for, for the Global Dysphagia Movement Group. All right, this is our presentation of video disclaimer. Okay, I think it will be good to have a disclaimer because at the end of the day, don't just use the information that you learn from here to self-diagnose purpose or self-treat or for any reason. You still need help from the professional. Make sure that you seek the right um, advice so that you won't do it wrong, all right? So the outline for today's presentation for my part is uh, what is NPC? Underlying, understanding the normal speech and swallowing process. Why speech and swallowing difficulties might develop before, during, or after radiotherapy in NPC? And what can be done? Hearing loss in patients with NPC will be presented by Mr. Liu. And how do speech therapists manage speech and swallowing difficulties in patients with NPC? And can speech and swallowing function be preserved after radiotherapy? Wow, I think this is a very interesting topic, isn't it? So let's start the presentation. What is NPC? So NPC refers to cancer at the back of the throat behind the nose. So if you look at this picture here, so it is exactly right at the back of the nose, but it's still part of the throat, but it's in the, uh, the nose region, all right? And the sign of nasopharyngeal cancer includes trouble breathing because if let's say you block this part, you might have difficulty breathing through the nose. So a person and, 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 um, experiencing this might end up breathing through the mouth. Um, difficulty breathing because uh, if it's blocked, then you find that it's difficult to say certain sounds, sounds that require the nasal sound, like, uh, like mama, the M sound, like uh, uh, nose, the N sound, will be difficult to be pronounced. And um, hearing, if let's say block the usation tube, then what happens is that there might be water retention in the ear, then causing some hearing difficulty. Uh, Ju uh, Junko is going to present more on this later. And there are three main uh, treatments for NPC. Uh, radiation therapy, the most common one. Chemotherapy, sometimes it's used together with radiation therapy. And surgery. Surgery is not so common. I think surgery usually is more for those who are more at the um, 
like a stage four or advanced stage uh, NPC. All right. Before we move on to, to, to find out more about um, the difficulty, let us understand the normal speech and swallowing process first. These are the structures important for speech and swallowing. All right. The nose, you need to speak certain sound through, like, um, through the nose, like the M sound, N sound, as I mentioned earlier, the nasal sound. You need the mouth, the tongue to articulate certain sound. All right. In fact, most of the sound, the lip, the teeth, the palate all play an important role. You need the, uh, the, the, the voice box, the vocal cords to vibrate to produce voice. And you need the power source, which is the lung, to push air to vibrate the vocal foam. All right? To speak out loud, you actually need your lung power to push, push more to produce louder voice. And then, of course, all these structures are controlled by the brain. So how much to talk and how well you talk and how soft you talk and how loud you talk or high, how, how high pitch is all can be controlled by the brain, all right? So this is just to illustrate to you, if we look into all the structures, right, it lies all the uh, muscles that are important. And all these muscles are interrelated and then um, they are all linked with, by the nerves and they, are, they all are, um, um, are controlled via the brain, okay? So the mouth area, you can see all the little dots actually referring to the sensation. What happens is that um, if let's say any part of these muscles are affected, it might affect your speech, it might affect your swallowing. Because speech and swallowing, we need our mouth to, to eat, we need our mouth to, eat, to, to, to speak as well, as well as the throat, and then uh, the nose as well. Okay. So how speech is produced? I mentioned earlier, you need the lung to push air out, Larynx is the voice box area. This is where voice will be produced when the air pushes through the uh, vocal foam. Then in our mouth, we articulate with our tongue. Then the nose will be involved in like uh, saying certain sound, all right? So what happened is that the area that is really mainly affected by radiotherapy is the area whereby the radiotherapy will be beamed through, which is around this region. So because the radio therapy is um, targeted that area. Muscles, nerve around the area might be affected during radio therapy. So now we try to understand how we swallow. Well, swallowing is controlled by the brain, just like the speech, involves 50 pairs of muscle. Wow, 50 pairs. Ah. When we swallow, we eat, we drink, eat KFC, everything. No need to think about 50 pairs. We thought there's only one pair. Just swallow, then that's it. But you will never imagine there are actually 50 pairs of muscles. And there are, there are five major pairs of like cranial nerve involved, the nerve that is involved in swallowing. And all five are very important. And there are two types of swallowing, automatic swallowing. It's just like, if I were to ask you, how long did you spend or how many swallows did you spend to finish a bowl of rice? You probably cannot even imagine how many swallows that you did and uh, how fast you managed to swallow. Or even think of like, you can't even remember that actually um, you finish eating until the, the, last, the last spoon that you, you were scooping up, all right? That's because those swallowing is more automatic, so it's unconscious. But we can have conscious swallowing as well. So conscious swallowing is like, if let's say you all try to perform this together with me, try to swallow saliva. Okay, so if you are swallowing saliva on my command, you are doing it consciously, so it's uh, conscious swallowing. So this is the process of swallowing. After you finish chewing in, in the picture A, you start to push the foot backward. So the tongue will move up, touch the palate, squeezing the foot in this direction. So once the foot reaches the throat area, you notice that the soft palate is closed. Why the soft palate is closed is because we are programmed in such that we try to avoid foot entering the nose. But then again, I'm pretty sure every one of you might, might have experienced water entering the nose, food entering the nose. Uh, at, at any part of your life. It's partly because sometimes we cannot be 100%, um, how to say, normal. Sometimes we might experience the co this coordination as well. But then those are pretty normal, all right? So food will be prevented from entering the nose. Then you realize that this flap here at the throat, it starts to flex down and all the way down. This is when airway will start to be protected by this area. So our airway will be closed, shut, 
food will start to enter the throat, then into the gullet, the food pipe. Then once it passes the uh, the throat, enter the food pipe, then the whole the the flap will start to open back. The airway will open again. This is the reason why when you swallow, you can't breathe. And also, this is the reason why our parents ask us, don't speak and eat at the same time. Because when you speak, your airways still need to open to vibrate. So when you swallow, you might get choked more easily. All right? Oh, then, this is the most important part that everybody would like to know, know more. Why speech or swallowing difficulties might develop before, during, after radiotherapy in NPC? And what can be done? All right. If you look at radiotherapy, so it's very targeted. So usually it, it will be more targeted for NPC cases towards the, the, the nasopharyngeal area. But then again, the beam will still get through, will have to go through the neck area. So the muscles area, for example, like if let's say it is around this region, right? Around the nose area. Then the muscles and the nerve which is surrounding that area will get exposure. In the olden day before the year 2000, the radiotherapy is actually not targeted. So those patients who were, who were radiated during that period of time usually come back with a lot of side effect. The whole neck is very stiff, the neck cannot turn, the tongue turns stiff, and usually the degree of like severity of speech and swallowing difficulty is, is, is more severe. But then again, since IMRT, which, which is introduced around year 2000, until now we are still using IMRT, it is more targeted, but we are still seeing the speech and swallowing, um, side, side effect on speech and swallowing. So reason is because when we beam through, the swallow muscles, the sub, most of the swallow muscles and the speech muscles are exposed as well. And then um, the nerve might be, might be affected. So muscles might get stiff over time, fibrosis. So the question now is that why speech and swallowing difficulties can develop even before radiotherapy? Because if NPC is diagnosed, so usually it's not common, all right, to be very frank. Speech and swallowing difficulty may be present at the time of NPC diagnosis if cranial nerve involved in speech and swallowing control are affected. For example, if you look at this, right, the red color spot here is actually referring to, let's say, the tumor area. But you also see that nerves can, can actually pass through that area. If it's the, the NPC presses on the nerve, it will cause the nerve to be dysfunctional. So if let's say it's controlling, let's say the cranial nerve 10, then the voice might be affected. If let's say it's controlling like um, the, the, the nerve 7, then the face muscle might be affected. All right. Then if let's say it is occluding the whole area, then our speech will be affected as well because then we can't say certain uh, nasal sounds. Okay. So it can also happen during and after treatment. Why, why is it so? Because effect of radiation on speech and swallowing function may vary. Some people have very significant effect when, when, um, when during treatment, whereby um, it's in rare condition, I even see like um, nerve, nerve problem, which is like very rare because it's like you can probably see one in a hundred. I mean, this is based on my experience. And then it was like really a significant um, effect. But then usually our nerve is actually radiation, so-called like resistance. It wouldn't get quite immediate. There are some other longer term process that may affect the nerve, but definitely not, not like a direct exposure. But we have seen cases who are like quite immediate. Then long term radiotherapy can lead to muscle fibrosis, muscle swelling and damage to the nerves. So muscle fibrosis is referring to when the muscle have um, start to turn stiff then usually what happens is that muscle fibrosis, once it happens, then a lot of the research and literature say that it is irreversible. And if it's possible, right, try to prevent it from happening. I will talk about how to prevent this at the end of this lecture. And usually these problems are not picked up until several months or years or after it is on, after its onset of the radiotherapy. Okay, so during radiotherapy, Radiotherapy might include chemotherapy as well. So people who went through like chemotherapy with radiotherapy oftentimes develop mucositis. So it is referring to inflammation and ulceration in the mouth. If you look at the first picture here, below here, mucositis, you get to see all the ulcers and then all the white patches there, all the inflammation happening and it is very, very painful. 
some pain to the extent that they can't really eat. So it is important to take note that actually if this is happening still, we still have to make sure that you get enough nutrition. All right? I'll talk about why nutrition is important later. And it can cause very dry mouth. When dry mouth is really um, happening, we will try to manage it. Uh, I, will mention, I, will, I will talk about how to mention dry mouth uh, later. And we rarely see muscle fibrosis or damage of the nerve at the beginning during the radiotherapy, but we have seen before. So what happened if, let's say, during radio, radiotherapy that you develop dry mouth, or we call it xerostomia? Um, first thing is that try to make sure that you perform oral hygiene after each meal and before bedtime, okay? Because um, food trap, then you want to make sure that it's clean so that you also want to prevent bacteria from growing. And when the mouth is too dry, right, no saliva, the pH inside our mouth is actually become, uh, it, it will change. And the teeth tends to decay even more easily. So you have to make sure that you, you maintain good oral hygiene. Keep water handy at all times to moisten the mouth. You can, if let's say you don't need, feel like using any other things, then just at least um, drink water whenever you are. And use artificial saliva like Oro7, um, Oro7 moisturizing gel. This one, um, we use it a lot in Singapore. And um, if let's say you are using like a uh, mouthwash, make sure that you avoid alcohol-based mouthwash like, like, like Listerine. Those alcohol-based one is going to dry up your mouth even more. So try to avoid using those. So instead of using those, you can consider using Oral 7 mouthwash. And what if, let's say, there's pain when chewing and swallowing due to inflammation and ulceration? Okay. As I mentioned earlier, maintaining good nutrition is a must because during those periods, you need to recover. Your, your cell need to recover. Okay. So you have to make sure that nutrition is, in, is sufficient. And bear in mind, the mask for radiation is to fit you nicely so that you don't make much movement so that the radiation can be targeted. You just imagine, if, let's say you start to lose weight, your face shrunk in size, your shoulders start to, start to lose muscle mass. You can't stay still. So the radiation might not be as targeted as um, because it was molded based on your previous, previous uh, body size, right? So it is very important to maintain your weight. And uh, another thing that you can do, if let's say there's any pain on chewing or swallowing, you can eat foods that are easy to chew or swallow, like porridge means meat or vegetable, soft fruits such as banana, cut foods into small pieces, avoid foods that irritates the mouth. For example, like some people like me like to eat sour plum, wow, but then sour plum is really, really causing very, very, a lot of pain, then just avoid eating sour plum. I like to eat curry as well. So the spicier, the better. Then avoid eating curry, maybe during the period of time. Eat foods as cold and at room temperature. Well, you know Chinese, they can, they can drink the soup boiling hot. So the Chinese have to probably start to put some ice inside the soup as well to cool it down. Okay. So another thing is that we, we have to modify diet and thicken up fluids if there's a need. So modified diet is referring to like whether you need to blend, you need to mince or you need to smoothen it, make it softer or thicken up the fluids. Uh, this one need to be advised by the speech therapist. So if let's say there's a need, see your speech therapist for advice. Okay, what about, if let's say still pain and chewing, then if pain is unbearable, right? And it's affecting your oral intake, you really cannot swallow, not that you don't want. Swallow, just cannot. Then do consider tube feeding. Um, try to avoid, try to avoid um, having like, um, like I don't want tube feeding. That's why I avoid everything. So I think the, the effect will be, will, be, will be worse after that. So bear in mind, a lot of the time, all this pain might, might, might be um, just temporary. After the treatment, then it might be back to, the swallowing might, might, might regain back. So it might just be temporary, just for the period of time you might need that. Another thing that you can use is to numb the mouth with ice chips, ice cream or flavored ice pops. All right, I think that's the, not a bad idea. I would love that. Supplement meals with high calorie, high protein drinks. Um, like Fortisip, you can use like a high protein kind of like diet. Um, ask your dietitian for advice. What about dry mouth uh, for late effect? It is exactly the same as um, when during uh, radiotherapy. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't talk f further about this because it's exactly the same. Okay, this one is something that uh, might develop as a late effect of radiotherapy, the taste bud, they might 
Um, patients might experience altered taste sensation. Sometimes they might taste a bit metallic. Uh, food might taste a bit metallic. So if let's say that's the case uh, or it really changes your appetite, you might want to eat small frequent meals and healthy snack. I mean, we eat more when we have appetite. We will still eat if let's say the food is there, right? So in that case, then you break it. Okay, I, I just eat small smaller amount. Maybe instead of like eating once every four hours, now you eat every two hours. Then you break into half, half each. Okay, so you still eat frequent meals, but healthy snacks. Uh. I mean, don't snack on potato chips and all this. And um, if let's say your taste bud or your the food tastes metallic to you, you try to avoid using the metal spoon. Use plastic utensil as, uh, instead. And um, use sugar-free lemon drops or mints when experiencing a metallic or bitter taste in the mouth. And try to avoid um, avoid food. Um, sorry, try try to use um, favorite food. For for um, try to use favorite food to to enhance your your um, appetite. Okay, what about bad breath halitosis? Okay, this is a common common um, side effect. And what causes halitosis or bad breath? It, it is usually caused by the accumulation of sludge at the back of the nose. Okay, why this, this develop? Okay, so firstly, mouth also play a part. If let's say your mouth is dry all the time, it can cause bad breath. But the really significant bad, bad breath and the, the very strong smell actually usually come from the nose, at the back of the nose. Remember that I told you, the, the food can enter the nose if, let's say, the soft palate doesn't close. Later, I will show you um, the, the picture of it. So in order to prevent this, you keep your mouth as moist as possible all the time. Perform nasal wash after each meal. So you just uh, flush the water through the nose and then let it come through the, the other side of the nose. So that all the dirt, all the, all the food residue will come out from the other side. Some, some, um, some of the patients, they put sodium bicarbonate so that it will, it, will, it will help to wash up even more, more, more easily, especially those food residue. Okay, so this is one that I saw from um, Taobao, la, this picture, or Amazon. You can go and take a look. There are different types you can buy from online nowadays. So if you look at this picture here, this picture shows a normal swallowing. When the food, the first picture on the left, if you look at it, if let's say during, during swallowing, right, the soft palate is closed, uh, approximating the, 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 the back of the throat muscle. So what happened is that um, the food will be prevented from entering the nose. But in this second picture here, you see that the soft palate doesn't approximate the, the back of the throat. So what happened is that the food enters the, the nose. So food will start to accumulate around this area. So over time, it turns into sludge and then it is very strong smell. And um, ENT management, sometimes they put in a, the, the scope with um, like a, a faucet. They will slowly um, take out bit by bit. But then again, I've seen patients who went through that procedure. The smell is still there. So if possible, try to prevent this from happening. All right? Okay. These are the important things to note. All right? That's why I put it green. Well, green is not like alarming kind of color, but I like green. So let's um, view this as important. If you see these symptoms, please go and consult an ENT doctor or speech therapist. Voice change. Suddenly the horse, the voice turned hoarse. A lot of nasal sound. Voice sounds like coming out from the nose or soft or breathy like. Breathy voice as in like, I, I think I can't even speak properly because my voice, I, I lost my voice. These are breathy voice. All right. A lot of patients with um, radiotherapy the late, late, late effect, one of the sim common symptoms also is like um, their voice turn breathy. So usually that is also an indication that certain nerve or one side, one side or two side of the vocal cord is actually not functioning that well, all right? And um, poor speech intelligibility, meaning that the speech is not very clear. When speak, it sounded slur. Sometimes can't really articulate very well. The tongue tremor, the tongue start to tremor and uh, restrict mouth opening, the mouth can't really open that well. Okay, so uh, food and liquid coming out from the nose, food sticking in the throat, the food like the keeps stucking in the throat. Then you need to drink a lot of water to flush down. 
coughing and choking when eating and drinking, this is a very serious uh, presentation. If let's say it is very common, especially for those who have went through radiotherapy, please go and see a doctor, especially the ENT or the speech therapist. Taking longer time to finish a meal, well, the record that I've ever heard of is two hours for one meal. And it's just less than a bowl of porridge. It's a like watery porridge. So it can be that long. Reason is, one, one scoop in, swallow, 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 doesn't go down, start to choke and attempt to swallow, swallow, swallow again. So just one spoon itself, it might take like five, 10 minutes to struggle to swallow down. So if possible, even like the mouth presentation or like food stick here, but still can eat, start to see the speech therapist and start to seek help so that hopefully we can try to prevent the condition from worsening too rapidly. And um, avoid certain food, avoid um, certain food, for example, like too dry or too big piece, then start to change the, the, the diet pattern, eating only porridge or eating only soupy things. Then those are like um, some pattern that we might see. Difficulty in breathing after eating and drinking together with flu-like symptoms, such as like fever, chills, drowsiness, increase in phlegm. And these are the chest, chest infection symptoms actually. If these symptoms are noted and it is frequent, because I've got some client came and see us only after like this become a, 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 a huge issue causing them to come to hospital because of chest infection. I mean, usually when this happens, the swallowing condition is actually severe. So don't let the swallowing condition turn severe before you seek help. All right. Now it's time to pass the mic back to Mr. Liu. Um, he will be talking about hearing loss in patients with NPC. All right, Mr. Liu. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yun. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yun. So now I continue my topic uh, on hearing loss in patients with MPC in audiological point of view and management. That is the outline of our topic. Includes signs and symptoms of MPC. How do we hear? Types and degree of hearing loss, hearing loss sign and symptoms. Why hearing loss might develop before, during, and after radiotherapy in NPC. And the final part will be on audiological management for NPC after medical clearance. Okay, on signs and symptoms of NPC, in its early stages, NPC may not cause any symptom. At the late stage, possible noticeable symptoms of NPC includes limb nodes enlargement in the neck, blood in saliva, sore throat, no split, no splotch, facial pain or numbness, blood or double vision, trouble breathing or talking, trouble opening the mouth, and the other part related to the hearing is hearing loss, ringing in the ears, frequent ear inspection, feeling of fullness in the ear, and usually this on one side, or we call it unilateral. Okay, now we come back to the basic knowledge on how do we hear. Our ears divided into three parts which are outer ear, middle ear, and the inner ear. Okay, so at first, sound wave enter the outer ear and travel through the ear canal to the eardrum. The eardrum then vibrates with the incoming sound and send the vibration to the three tiny bones in the middle ear. The bone in the middle ears amplify the sound vibrations and send them to the inner ear. The sound vibration activate tiny hair cell in the inner ear, which in turn release neurochemical messages. Then the auditory nerve carry this electrical signal to the brain, which translate it into a sound we can understand. So this is how we hear. Okay, now we come to the type and degree of hearing loss. Hearing loss is caused by damage to one or more part of the hearing system. The type of hearing loss depends on where the damage occurred. 
case is the structure of the ears. <clears throat> there are three types of hearing loss, which is conductive hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, and mixed hearing loss. Conductive hearing loss occurs when there is damage or disease in the outer or the middle ear. This includes the pinna, ear canal, eardrum, or bones in the middle ear. Conductive hearing loss can sometimes corrected with surgery or medication. So this is very important that if the hearing test result, so there's any conductive element, this is a must for the audiologist to refer the patient for medical clearance before pro proceed with the audiological management. Especially nowadays, people might do the hearing test online and directly proceed with the hearing aid fitting without any diagnostic test. This might cause the delay of medical treatment if their hearing loss is due to the medical condition. Here, I advise every one of you to go to the hearing center with qualified authorities to get the hearing test done to avoid any complication happen later. Okay, conductive hearing loss can cause by fluids in the middle ear, otitis media, which is very common in MPC patient, damage to the middle ear, bones, damage to the eardrum, earwax, birth defects, like microtia, atresia. Okay, now you come to the sensory hearing, you know, hearing loss occurs when there is damage to the inner ear, the cochlea, which is this part. Sensory neural hearing loss is usually permanent and cannot be corrected. So hearing aids and other assertive hearing technologies can offer help this type of hearing loss. So sensory neural hearing loss can cause by natural aging process, genetics, exposure to loud noise, medication that are toxic to the ears, traumatic injury, and illnesses. Okay, mixed hearing loss is a combination of both conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. Therefore, both the outer or the middle and the inner ear are damaged, and this will cause the mixed hearing loss. Degree of hearing loss refer to the severity of loss and are generally described as mild, moderate, moderately severe, severe or profound. The loudness of sound is measured in units called decibel, or in short, dB. For example, whispering occurred in 15 dB. Normal conversation is 40 to 60 dB. Rock concert, 120 dB. Gunshot at 140 dB. Okay, this is the classification for degree of hearing loss. People with 20 dB or below, are in normal hearing category. Our company name, 20 dB, as you can see the logo here, is to remind everyone that we should protect our hearing, maintain at 20 dB or below, as 20 dB is the borderline for normal hearing. So those who have hearing at 21 to 40 dB consider to have mild hearing loss, moderate hearing loss at 41 to 55, moderate, Pre-severe hearing loss is at 56 until 70, 71 until 90 is considered a severe hearing loss, and 91 above is considered a profound hearing loss. This is the categorized for the degree of hearing loss. Okay, this is diagram show the from familiar sound. Okay, so the top part here, 0, 10, 20 consider soft sound, like whispering is at 15, as I mentioned just now. Uh, conversation, okay, this is a speech sound. 20 to 60, and this is the loud sound, rock concert, gunshot. So what happened to people who has mild hearing loss? A person with mild hearing loss may hear some speech sound. Okay, if you can see here, as I mentioned, it's 21 to 40. So a hearing, person with mild hearing loss may hear some speech sound, but soft sound are hard to hear. For moderate hearing loss, a person with a moderate hearing loss may hear almost no speech when another person is talking at a normal level. Those with moderate severe hearing loss need to ask people to repeat themselves during conversation, both in person or on the phone. A person with severe hearing loss will hear no speech when the person is talking at a normal level and only hear can hear some loud sound, like traffic noise, 
A person with profile hearing loss will hear no speech and only can hear some very loud sound, like firecracker and also the gunshot sound. Okay. Hearing loss, sign and symptoms. Hearing loss may occur gradually over many years and suddenly or suddenly and its duration can vary. Hearing loss can affect an individual socially and emotionally. It can make communication with family and friends difficult. When untreated, it can lead to the stress from straining to hear, embarrassment from misunderstanding others, and eventually withdraw and isolation. So audiological management, audiological management is very important to people who suffer from hearing loss to improve their quality of life. Okay, here are the signs and symptoms of hearing loss includes increasing the volume of the radio or TV, difficulty understanding others in the presence of background noise, frequently asking others to repeat what they say, people sound like they are mumbling, and avoidance of social situations is some of the example. Okay, now we come to the main topic today. Why hearing loss might develop before, during, and after radio therapy in NPC? As I have mentioned early, early stages of NPC may not cause any symptom. At the late stage, possible symptoms of NPC like hearing loss ringing in the ear will be observed. How actually this happened? Okay, so at the late stage, NPC can grow and press on one of the two eustachian tube. So this is the MPC. So if you're pressing, this is the eustachian tube. So at the last stage, the MPC will pressing to this tube. This tube, actually the function of this tube is to help regulate pressure in and drain fluid from the middle ear. So the growth of MPC will cause the eustachian tube getting narrower and finally close up. The fluids accumulate in the middle ear and cause otitis media. The fluids might rupture the eardrum, causing ear discharge. All this will cause conductive hearing loss and some will experience ringing in the ear as well. Okay, so during radiotherapy, in MPC, some types of surgery and radiotherapy for MPC can cause swelling around the eustachian tube. And again, this will cause autistic this media. In some cases, patient hearing will get back to the normal once the swelling goes down. And also during the radiotherapy, some radiotherapy for MPC can cause damage to the inner hair cell and hearing nerve that send message to the brain. This damage will cause sensory neural hearing loss, and this may be permanent. Okay, so this is the hearing part, and any damage to the nerve here will cause the sensory neural hearing loss. So this will this might happen during the radiotherapy for MPC. So after the radiotherapy in MPC. The most common complication after radiotherapy treatment for MPC were found to be eustachian tube dysfunction and again, otitis media in this case. Radiotherapy for MPC that caused damage to the inner ear hair cell to some patient after the treatment will cause sensory neural hearing loss. If the radiotherapy for MPC causing the eustachian tube dysfunction and damage to the inner hair cell after the treatment, then this patient will have mixed hearing loss. Okay. The hearing loss developed before, during, and after radiotherapy in MPC is very from individual depends on the size of the MPC itself, treatment method, and other health condition. Some might not have any hearing loss. Some may only have conductive or only sensory neural or both mixed hearing loss. Okay, now we go to the audiological management for MPC after medical clearance. Normally, the specialist, especially ENT doctor, will refer their patient for autological management if their patient, sorry, if their patient shows some degree of hearing loss. 
So these are the, so the patient will come for the audiological management, they will go through this process. Includes hearing assessment, pre-fitting counseling, hearing aid selection and prescription, hearing aid fitting and orientation, follow-up, include hearing aid verification, hearing aid validation, fine-tuning, monthly, quarterly, yearly review, and finally, hearing aid servicing. Okay, in hearing assessment, full hearing diagnostic tests will be carried out. Include thing, otoscopic examination to check the outer ear, tympanometry to check the middle ear, and finally, the hearing test, we call it pure tone audiometry, to determine the type and degree of hearing loss. In pre-fitting counseling, during this counseling session, audiologists will explain a general issue pretending to hearing aids and hearing loss, such as expectation and limitation of using hearing aid. Audiologists also address all inquiries or relevant issue during this pre-fitting counseling. Next is the hearing aid selection and prescription. Audiologists will introduce several options of hearing aid to patient after considering the factors below before commenting the before recommending the hearing aid that are most suitable. So the factors include types and degree of type and degree of hearing loss, age, budget, lifestyle, like occupation, social activities, comfort and visibility of hearing aids and also a condition of the, of the ears. In this session, hearing aid trial is possible to allow patients to try on the recommended hearing aid before they do the selection. Okay, these are the style of hearing aids which we will recommend for the patient. Uh, for MPC patients, normally we recommend behind the ear types of hearing aids because it's easy to manage, especially we then normally they need the volume control and provide sub and this behind the ear type we provide sufficient power to help them to hear better and also due to the ear discharge issue then the behind the ear type is the most suitable because the ear discharge might damage uh, the other types of the hearing aids especially the inside the ear types or receiver in the canal so this one we seldom recommend what we recommend will be the behind the ear types but for those who have repeatedly ear discharge, so the most suitable type will be the bone conduction hearing aids. Okay, now come to the hearing aid fitting and orientation. Uh, during the hearing aid fitting session, audiologists will ensure amplification signal does not exceed level where the patient complains it's to be too loud or too soft. At initial stage, audiologists will set lower amplification level that allows patient to adapt to the use of hearing aid. And during the orientation, audiologists will guide them on how to operate the hearing aid, change of volume, programming the hearing aids, and perform daily, daily general care on hearing aids. How to insert the battery, how to insert ear mold and remove the ear mold from the ears. Audiologists may also involve caregiver on this orientation session, especially if the patient are the elderly person. Audiologists will brief on the hearing aid warranty issue and post fitting follow-up in this session. So next is the follow-up session. So during this session, audiologists will adjust and fine-tune the hearing aid sound set, setting according to the patient's feedback until the patient has adapted to the amplified level. So during the follow-up, we also will conduct hearing aid verification and hearing aid validation to ensure that the hearing aid is at its most suitable level to use by the user. And then, for, and then the audiologist will schedule the appointment by monthly or quarterly follow-up for the first two years and then follow-up by the yearly review. And this depends on the, the patient's ear's condition as well. Okay, last part will be the hearing aid service thing, like listening check, cleaning, general service. This is to ensure the hearing aid is, is well functioning. Okay, now we come to the summary. Okay, proper audiological management. I'm oh, sorry. Okay, in summer, uh, summary for the hearing loss in patients with MPC, 
Conductive hearing loss is the most common in MPC secondary to the otitis media before, during, and after radiotherapy. Sensory neural hearing loss may develop during and after the radiotherapy due to damage to the inner hair cell. Proper audiological management after medical clearance able to help MPC patients with hearing loss to improve their quality of life. And early amplification can help MPC patients with hearing loss to prevent auditory deprivation. Okay, this is my part. Now I pass back to Mr. Yoon to continue his topic. Topic here. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu. It was an interesting presentation on audiological uh, management for NPC patients. I find it very interesting because, uh, well, I, I don't usually follow follow up on what, what exactly is being done during the uh, audiology um, like, uh, consultation and everything. I think, I, I think it's very important that to make sure that um, it's being managed well um, by the audiologist for someone who have gone through radiotherapy. So now is uh, the last part of uh, my presentation. How do speech therapists manage speech and swallowing difficulties in patients with NPC? Well, I'm talking based on the context in Singapore. Well, I believe that um, different countries has got a different way of like managing um, cases. So uh, we can share our way of like managing, then perhaps we can learn from each other. We can have a different session on this. So how do speech therapists manage here? So first we do assessment, clinical baseline evaluation, we provide different types of like um, texture for patient to try out a different type of food and then see how they present their symptoms and then see if let's say what what are the suitable texture of food or fluid that might be suitable for the patient. If let's say patient is not safe for oral feeding, then uh, we might recommend tube feeding while we might send patient for further investigation uh, like the objective assessment which is a video fluoroscopy, VFS. Later, I will show you video fluoroscopy video so that you have an understanding on like how, how it looks like and why we perform it. Then fiber optic endoscopic examination for swallowing fees. Um, these are the two common objective assessments done in Singapore. So this is how VFS is done. So you can see here the, the pink color is actually the, the chair, then fluoroscope and the x-ray tube. These are the, the, the machine that we use to perform the video fluoroscopy. Then you, the, the image will be shown on the, the screen. We will record it. We will, this is how it looks like. This is the jaw on the x-ray, our cervical bone, then the throat area. The black color things is actually the liquid that the patient swallow. So on the right-hand side, um, you can see that all the white color stuff here, actually white color stuff is actually barium powdered. Um, I, we put into the food or the, or the fluid to dye it up so that uh, on x-ray, it will look black in color. Okay, later we'll show you the video, um, video fluoroscopy video together with uh, the other video. All right, together with this video. This is a picture of me performing feast for one of my friends. Uh, we use the endoscope and then we scope through the nose all the way to the throat. Then we'll view... Um, the throat while we feed the patient with um, different type of texture. And usually we, we put uh, color dye into those, those food or the liquid so that it can be seen more clearly. So I will show you, I will show you the video now. So this is a video of um, video fluoroscopy and how well a person swallow when it's normal. So this is how it looks like. So this is the jaw. Okay, hang on, uh, because the video is not up yet. Okay, it's a bit delay. All right, this is how the video looks like. Video first copy, this is the jaw. This is the mouth area. This is the throat, throat area. This is the airway. So this is the, the, the backbone, the cervical bone. So when a person swallow, right, this is a normal, normal swallowing. So basically this normal swallowing shows that the food will just 
glide in nicely without leaving even a single residue. So the person is chewing. So when the food is ready, right, the, the, the tongue will just push it all the way through into our food pipe. And this is a normal swallow. Okay, now I'm going to show you an abnormal swallowing. Okay, this is... This is, um, okay, while waiting for the, the X-ray or the VFS video to be, to be loaded. So this is exactly, and this is actually an NPC case uh, for this particular video. So this patient is actually eating uh, rice. All right, it's a bit slow. I think partly because it's a video file. So um, hopefully, okay, there you go. It'll be loaded soon. All right, there you go. So you can see there's already some food residue inside the throat and the patient is chewing. Okay, food is going down. Pay attention at this area whereby whether the food enters the food passage or not. It's so little and then there's so much food that's stuck inside the throat. See, all these are the rice that is stuck inside the throat. So, so what should we do? Then what happens is that this patient has been taught to actually use water to flush down with a technique to protect the airway. Have a look. Okay, patient is drinking water soon. So pay attention at this airway here. Okay, as the patient swallow, right, you can you notice that food are now going down the food passage, but there's still a lot of residue inside the throat. At the same time, there, there are already some uh, food or liquid entering the airway. But this patient managed to actually protect the airway and then prevent it from entering further down, which is um, the lower airway. And if further down will be the lung. Okay? All right. So um, I will continue with my presentation. Um, I will show you the fees. How does the fees look like? All right. This is the, the this is a fees video. This is the, the airway. This is our throat. This is from a different angle, from the scope angle. And this is our tongue, okay. The food basically is, um, basically is dyed with a green color, all right? So you see that the food is entering the throat. The drink, actually it's a drink, it's not food, okay? The fluid entering with, it's a big green color because we put uh, food coloring, green in color. And we are trying to see these patients actually swallow quite delay. So that's why you see that the, the, he didn't really swallow until after a while. So after that, then we try to check whether there's any, any fluid entering the airway. And this is important because this is to ascertain whether is it safe for, for the patient to continue eating or drinking. So we have to make sure that safety is a, a priority as well um, when managing uh, cases like this. All right. So I, I will close this video. I'll continue with my presentation. So before starting chemo or radiotherapy, what, should, what will speech therapists do? So we assess speech and swallowing function and recommend diet or alternative feeding method. All right, for example, like whether there's a need for nasogastric tube, the tube feeding, or there's a need for swallowing strategies as appropriate, whether any strategy can ensure that the swallow is being swallowed safely, sorry, the food can be swallowed safely, and uh, counseling on the possible immediate and long-term side effect of chemo or radiotherapy and ways to manage should those side effects occur. You see, the thing is that when I first started working as a speech therapist, those were, those, those years were 2001. So those patients, when I first saw, right, uh, those patients who didn't go through IMRT, but those like um, the, the old type of like radiotherapy, which is like, it will just blast and there's not focus. So what happened is that we see those like um, really significant side effect from those radiotherapy. So a lot of the patient come to us and then start to say, why this is happening to me? And why, the, why we were not told that this is happening? This is going to happen and there's such side effect. I would have chosen not to do it. So you see the, the impact just um, psychologically on, on patients who are experiencing such side effects is so great. 
and once their quality of life is affected, then that's where seriously emotionally, psychologically can, can really like um, dampen significantly. So I think it's very important to, 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 to inform because right now we are entering the new era whereby for cases who have gone through radiotherapy or even before, we encourage to do some ter therapy exercises to prevent or actually to preserve the speech and swallowing function. I will talk more about this later. What about during and after chemotherapy? We do assessment for speech and swallowing function as well. We try to recommend diet or alternative feeding method or swallowing strategies as appropriate because during and after, they might start to experience different kind of problem, I, which I mentioned earlier. Then we try to teach exercise to preserve swallowing function. And this is whereby in the area whereby more and more research is coming out. And we notice that um, the research shows that actually it, it helps to kind of like uh, maintain flexibility of the muscles and also potentially prevent swallowing function from worsening. Of course, there are more work to be done, more research to be done to, 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 to try to find out if let's say it is really like uh, helping uh, more on a long-term basis. But definitely, I must say that based on my personal experience, like um, because I conduct talk to the nasopharyngeal cancer group in Singapore, those um, cancer survivor, they actually I noticed one thing is that there's one uh, NPC um, survivor who is a triathlete. He went through the old type of like radiotherapy. Actually, until today, right, his function is still preserved after I think more than twenty years, uh, which is quite amazing. Because why? He maintained an active lifestyle. So after radiotherapy, tell yourself, if let's say you went through that, life goes on, maintain even healthier lifestyle. Make sure that more exercises, the preserved swallowing function exercise must do. Then when you do it, the muscle got worked out, then more blood circulation, muscle might, 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 might be healthier. So you hopefully you can prevent um, those uh, fibrosis and, and all those unnecessary changes. So um, teach exercises to improve muscle strength or muscle movement. We, we, we teach that as well. Refer patient to other professional for further management if necessary. Okay, if let's say the speech impairment is, is only mild, we do oral motor exercise. We try to teach all the muscle movement, sorry, all the movement for the tongue, the lip, everything. Hopefully we can try to preserve the function as much as possible and um, or try to prevent it from worsening so rapidly. Compensate, compensatory strategies, how to, strat, uh, how to talk more, more clearly with um, a strategy, all right? And if let's say the condition becomes severe, like the speech becomes unclear, still we will start to do, we will try to advise to, perf to perform motor exercises. So for as much as like the tongue can move, we try to push to, to do more. Hopefully we can, can still maintain the, the function. Uh, compensatory strategies is the same. We will still try to teach as much as we can to, to make, make sure that the speech, if possible, um, the whatever preserved function that is still, still, still um, kind of like preserved, then we try to make full use of, of, of those function and try to speak um, if possible. If let's say it's, it's difficult, then uh, prosthetic management might be required. For example, like voice amplifier for those who lost, uh, who can't really speak loudly. Palatal leaf, which I will show later, what is it? Or palatal augmentative prosthesis. Augmentative and alternative communication. As shown at the side here, you see the iPhone with uh, pictures here. If really up to that level whereby really can't express verbally, you can either write, you can even like press on those pictures to, to express for you. Um, this is what we mean of like uh, alternative communication, not through verbal, not through speaking but through maybe uh, devices. They are high-tech, low-tech. Low-tech, for example, just a piece of paper, then you just write your needs. Surgical management, for those who experience like a voice box issue, vocal cord not really moving well, then we can perform vocal cord medialization. So this is prosthetic devices. Okay, this is done in Singapore as well. Not many institutions in Singapore perform this, but there's, there's one clinic called the Prosthetic Speech and Swallowing Clinic in the National Dental Center. Actually, I set up um, together with a, a prosthodontist called Dr. Teo. He's now the assistant director in NTC. So what happened is that uh, we work together. We discuss on what are the best, best uh, prosthesis suitable for patients. 
So if you look at this first one, parietal augmentative prosthesis or P, uh, parietal drop, we call it, this is on the right-hand side. You re realize that from the side angle, it is very thick. And this is meant to be thick because it is hooked up onto your upper teeth. You realize that all this wire is supposed to hook onto your teeth. Then all this is supposed to make it thick so that your tongue, for example, like the tongue is very limited in movement. You can still contact it even though you can't reach up to the, the actual palate, but right now you bring it down for the palate to reach. All right. What about palatal leaf? Palatal leaf refer to this part on your left hand side. See this extension? This is supposed to be the plate whereby it lifts up the soft palate. So, why do we need to lift up the soft palate? Okay, here we go. So, if you look at the picture here, palatal augmentative prosthesis is referring to like if the tongue needs to say, for example, the curl sound. This is for the curl sound at the back of the tongue, moving up, approximating the, the palate. But what if, let's say, the tongue cannot move so well? So these prosthesis act as a palate, but it is um, like a denture, but a thicker denture. Bring it down the surface, then the tongue, because the, there's a limitation, it can reach now. So potentially, having these prosthesis in can facilitate a clearer speech production. Based on the remaining function that the patient has. Okay, so as you look into this picture here, you realize that actually this is like a piece of um, like a thicker dentures but extended all the way to the palate so that the tongue can reach. So how do we make this? The dentist will put an impression all the way in and like a plasticine actually. Then ask the patient to use the tongue to push as much as possible, as much as possible. Then we get an impression of the tongue. This is how much the tongue can push. So basically, it's exactly how much the tongue can contact. So it's actually a full contact of the tongue and the palate when the prosthesis is in. On your right-hand side, this is what we meant of like um, palatal lift. When the soft palate, which is around here, stop moving, food can enter the nose or voice will start to leak out. Your, your, your speech, speech sound will start to leak out from your nose. So you will start to hear something like the little nasal sound. This is just an example of like a nasal, nasal speech. So what happens is that when you put in the palatal lift, it will push the soft palate up at this level. It will help to close off or minimize the opening. So it might minimize the nasal sound and someone may speak more clearly. All right and then potentially might, might help to prevent food from entering the nose that much. All right, so this is something that actually uh, we, we can do in Singapore. So for those who are from overseas, you may want to consider approaching some of the prosthodontists there and ask, if let's say you see head and neck cancer patients or even people who went through radiotherapy to the head and neck, you can consider using this approach. So what about medialization thyroplasty? So this is done by ENT, not me. But sometimes I facilitate ENT in holding the scope when he's performing the, the procedure. So when one side of the vocal cord, let's say, in this case, this arrow is showing that the left side of the vocal cord, actually in this, in this case, it's actually left side, huh? although it's your right side, is not moving. So this side is still moving. So it can come all the way to the center, but there's a big gap. So the voice was sound like this. So there's no voice. It will sound breathy. All right. So what happened is that in, this is the gap. So such a big gap, right? So we want to close off the gap. What do we do? We can use either one method that I showed earlier. Push this part to the center. One is to inject something, to buck it up, to make it fatter. So when it reaches the center side, when the other side, which is moving, can approximate well, the voice usually can be better. Not all the time, but usually. Those cases that I've seen, I performed together with the ENT, the outcome is quite impressive. All right? So, for example, you can actually inject something like this into there, into the vocal fold, then uh, bulk it up, then the other side can approximate. Another way is that create an um, opening at the thyroid cartilage, at the throat area there, here. Then you implant a silicone to push the, uh, the vocal cord to the center. Then when both vocal fold can, 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 can reach, then voice can be produced. All right, what about swallowing impairment when it's mild? How do we deal with it? We can train swallowing strategy to ensure that swallowing is still easy or safe. 
we try to teach swallowing exercise because even though science is, has been shown that, um, I mean, there's already this indication to show that swallowing is affected, but we also hope that it can be prevented to worsen further. Okay, or, or we, we try to preserve the, the function as much as possible. It is still better to do some something to maintain the function than not doing anything at all. All right. So you may require some do it diet or fluid modification. So in this photo, this is a unit that I like to I like to use in treatment for patients with NPC because it it shows it can show the way they function in the laptop. And then generally to teach strategy, this is so much easier. All right. This is called the SEMG biofeedback. I train other speech therapists to perform this. I'm a trainer in this region. So this is to train swallowing. This is to train on the oral motor, but oral motor usually is not necessary for cases with uh, radiotherapy. It's more for, not, not for the lip, but the tongue, yes, but this is not, not so much for the tongue. Swallowing exercise, then it can be reflected. Then the patient know what they're doing, and then we can set the goal, and they keep pushing themselves beyond boundary. It's basically just like an, a virtual dumbbell. All right, it's like a virtual dumbbell. I call this the, uh, the, the, the swallowing gym. I personally call it swallowing gym. It's like a dumbbell because you can't hang the dumbbell here and do swallowing exercise this way. So this way, you push the patient to swallow as hard as they can. So from there, then you hope that you will buck up the muscle, you make the muscles stronger, or you use it to train swallowing strategy. And uh, if the swallowing condition becomes moderate, meaning that still can eat, but um, requires some, some modification, then the patient might be eating modified diet, for example, like those blended diet as shown here. And a patient might be taught swallowing strategy like every protection strategy or even hit turn or hit tail, all these exercises. Um, and swallowing exercises, same thing. Even though it is severe, moderate, still do something rather than not doing anything. All right? Prosthetic management, I think that is important already. You just imagine one thing. If the tongue already showing sign that cannot approximate the, the palate. So basically, the tongue is not pushing against anything. So there's no resistance at all. It's just like us. When we speak, right, we can regulate our, our, our tongue pressure towards the, the palate. So we, when, as we push, then we, as we push, actually, the muscle use strength because you push against resistance. But what about if, let's say, it's just hanging and not reaching anything? I believe that the muscle fiber might start to deteriorate even faster because there's no resistance at all. So if you put in a, a palatal prosthesis and the tongue can approximate, the patient can actually constantly do a push against the prosthesis. And this itself is, is an exercise. So there, there are some old literature that shows that actually doing prosthetic sometimes help with even the oral motor exercise because there is something to push against. So surgical management, might be required, especially, for example, like for the medialization or anything. Um, severe swallowing impairment. So we still encourage swallowing exercises as a maintenance exercise. Composite strategy, if possible. Well, just now you sh I show you the VFS. The patient can swallow with water and then food can go through. If there's no compensation, compensatory strategy, right? That patient actually is labeled as severe as well because food cannot even get through. It all gets stuck in the throat. But because of strategy, it works. So swallow is still possible. So this patient actually is still eating because he was taught to protect the airway and at the same time to deal with the food that is stuck in the throat. Then food can still get through. Then he's still eating, although the swallowing impairment is severe. So prosthetic management usually required for this stage. Surgical management, I mentioned earlier, or oftentimes if let's say not possible to continue with oral feeding then it's nasal, nasal gastric tube or the, the PEG tube. All right. Can speech and swallowing function be preserved after radiotherapy? Well, this is a very important question, isn't it? Let me share with you. Swallowing preservation exercises. This has been introduced for um, now. I think this is the in thing. Head and neck cancer, as long as it's radiation to the head and neck, this will apply as well. NPC cases, same. A set of... It, it, it refers to a set of exercises with the aim to maintain the movement of the range of motion of the oral, the throat, and the voice box. So all these are important for speech and eating. 
to learn this, please consult your speech therapist or pathologist to learn this, all right? So I, 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 I don't think I can really train this um, here because uh, of time limit. Um, swallowing preservation exercises can be performed before, during, and after completed the radiotherapy as well, all right? You can start to do before, during, and after, even though after many years later, keep doing it like a daily, daily routine. Then learning SPE through telepractice session, it is actually possible. There are different types. There are some actually it's possible to do through telepractice. I've done some for some of the overseas patients. All right. In summary, speech and swallowing difficulties might occur before, during, and after radiotherapy. Consult with speech therapists even before starting a radiotherapy and learn and start to perform swallowing preservation exercise even before, during, and after completed the radiotherapy. So thank you very much for, for, your, for, for, for coming by and tune in. So um, I hope that you find this, this um, live presentation beneficial. And um, if you want to download the handouts, you can visit the, the website or you scan this QR code. All right. So um, I will... You can, you can visit my, my, my blog uh, at uh, www.dysphagia.sg. You click under the, the blog. I will try to upload tomorrow or tonight if possible. Okay? So this is my email, my contact, if you want to WhatsApp me. And um, this is 20DB, um, the toll-free number if you want to call them for more information or about uh, hearing aids information or WhatsApp them. Well, that's it. That's all from me. Thank you so much, uh, Junko and Wailam, for a very informative uh, session. Um, yeah, so Wailam, personally, for myself, I think uh, the highlight about uh, swallowing exercises for preserving the swallowing function in patients with MPC, it, it really, um, I'm very... Uh, encouraged to hear about that and I think for myself as a speech therapist um, I think this is something that we should lobby or we should create more awareness especially while working at our workplaces uh, and while working with the ENTs and also our patients so for that 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 was um, the highlight uh, it really reminded me about not just touch and go but really work with our patients um, you know in the rehab process um, I do have yeah, a question yes. here. Um, we are now going to take some questions from our viewers. And um, okay, so the first question um, about trismus, the jaw opening, can it be improved with therapy? Actually, there are some therapy like um, the traditional one is to use like um, three fingers to measure whether uh, our jaw is really opening well. I uh, you can try and then we try to get a, uh, so that uh, the viewers can see also. Usually we can fit in three fingers into our mouth. This is called a three finger test. Lah. You see? Our own finger, of course. I, if I put my fat finger into your mouth, I don't think it can enter. <laughs> so if you start to realize that you can't put in three fingers into your mouth, actually that might be an indication that there might be the, some sign of like Christmas. If that's it's only two fingers, right? It is still possible to do prosthesis. Or in fact, if let's say this remind me of thing, you know that when you do want to do prosthesis, like I mentioned earlier, you need to have at least two fingers. Okay, opening. Less than two fingers, the prosthesis cannot go in, because it's quite thick. All right. So um, maintain the jaw opening is important because uh, we have seen very severe cases whereby they can't even open like this. Okay. So how do we improve that? Um, there are cases. There there are exercises for example like those jaw stretching use um the traditional one is they use tongue depressor they stack up and possible then they continue adding in but this one please for those who are experiencing this please consult your speech therapist to perform this because end of the day is if the muscle is fibrose right you have to manage it carefully because fibrous muscle can break also so you don't want to like uh, put in, then you try to ply open all this. No, try not to. Do it gradually. And also, there's another thing is that um, you, can, you can get some device called like the terabyte to, 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 to try to like uh, work on opening the, 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 the mouth, the jaw. So terabyte is another thing to consider. Okay. So certainly, um, 
you can use all this method because it has been shown that actually it helps to improve the, the range of the jaw opening. Try to avoid, um, prevent it from worsening. If let's say there's a sign to show that uh, there's already a sign of like uh, the mouth getting smaller and smaller, uh, prevent it from getting worse. Yep, any more questions? Yeah, I think I have one more question here. Um, I'm going to show it on the screen from June. Yeah, um, sure. Is there, if there is a severe difficulty in swallowing during radiotherapy, which is preferred, NG or a PEG? Oh, good question. All right, it really depends because um, if the, the condition is um, just started, then often time, right, based on my experience in Singapore is that, um, I mean, Asian is Asian. We, we, when you talk about like need the surgery, a keyhole surgery at the stomach to put in a tube, right? They, they, they take some time to, to process. So um, usually we talk about NG tube first, then make an attempt to do something like uh, exercise and then see whether it helps or not. If, if it doesn't really help to, to improve on the swallowing function, then perhaps uh, we can talk about like this might be a long-term thing, then um, consider PEG. So immediately, oftentimes, it's not that like we don't want to encourage PEG. Sometimes you see patients come in, the moment, usually in Singapore, is that the moment they see us, right, from our experience that it is not a mouth swallowing problem. They already self-compensated at home. They try to flush with water, everything. Then until that really cannot eat, then or maybe we only see them when they have already start to develop chest infection. Then only discover that swallowing is already severe. So by then, then it's a bit hard. You can, you can mention about PEG, but oftentimes at the acute stage, here we use NG tube first. Then when everything is established, you did a VFS, then you realize that nothing seems to be like functioning as well. Swallowing based on our clinical judgment, um, it seems like safe swallowing is very hard to be established. Prognosis might not be that great based on the presentation, for example, there are some cases whereby there might be fibrosis potentially at the cricophagal opening, cricophagal muscle. And usually for those situations whereby PG might be a better, better suggestion. Yeah. Yes, any more question? Yep. Thanks. Uh, thank you, June, for your question. Um, we have another question from um, Danush. Um, can you tell the swallowing assessment protocol and assessment tools that you use for NPC patients? That's a good question, actually. Um, well, there's no specific swallowing protocol. It's still the clinical based evaluation. You see, uh, the thing is that um, NPC cases, I mean, those patients who, who present with uh, uh, speech and swallowing difficulty, they went through the radiation and oftentimes they develop what we call bulbar palsy which is uh, cranial nerve palsy at the lower level, lower motor neuron problem. So we do all the cranial nerve assessment. For example, if let's say there is, um, I, I can share a screen on a video. And um, for example, like if there is, I, I, I hope that I can, I can open up the video soon. So what happened is that if let's say you see like the tongue fasciculation presentation, okay? then what happened is um, that that could be an indication that the cranial nerve 12 is affected. So based on this, then you know that actually the impairment is at the lower lower level. Then from there, then you can start to do hy uh, hypothesis on like the potential impact on the swallowing or the speech. So from there, you can start to plan your treatment. And also, if you are understanding the radiotherapy effect more, then perhaps a stretching of the tongue might be one of the, one of the treatment options to consider. So I'm going to show you now tongue fasciculation. Then um, you have some idea of like, um, okay, so it's just for interest. Huh? People usually more visual, they prefer to see a uh, video. So tongue fasciculation refer to like a wavery tongue like this. You see that uh, there's a lot of like movement on the tongue. So usually these are the indication of the lower motor neuron uh, cranial nerve 12 issue. All right. So if that is seen, then oftentimes um, the, the, the condition is not really that reversible, okay? 
in that case, then you can consider like maybe prosthetic management. If let's say there's still some movement, then we try to lower it down for the tongue to, to approximate. So hopefully it helps with the oral phase if the pharyngeal phase is not affected that much. Uh, assessment, uh, one thing I would advise is that because of the poor contraction, right? The way to assess might be slightly different from the way to assess a uh, stroke patient. Because a lot of these patients after post radiotherapy therapy because of the weak pharyngeal contraction, thicker texture oftentimes is really difficult for them to swallow. Just now my VFS, you can see that how hard for food to get through the cricular pharyngeal area or the upper esophageal sphincter. So when you assess, when a patient not swallowing well on thicker, don't stop there. Try your best to see whether if let's say thin fluids works. And even when you do VFS, thicker not well, that doesn't mean that thin fluids will not perform well. So try your best to at least try a little bit and then see how, how the swallowing presents. All right? I hope that answered your questions. All right, any more questions? Yes, one more from Siu Yi. Um, ah. uh, for severe amputee patients who have totally lost their laryngeal elevation during swallow, is there anything we can do about it other than tube feeding? Well, Siu Yi, I believe that you are one, one of the speech therapists, right? Good question, actually. Yeah, she is. <laughs> where, oh, she is. Oh, where is she from? <laughs> <laughs> very, good thing. Very well. Yes. Okay. Good question. Laryngeal elevation leads to UES opening and epiglottic retroflexion, isn't it? All right. But then again, don't forget, laryngeal elevation itself is only part of the swallowing process. Okay. Unfortunately, for 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 sometimes after radiotherapy, because of the muscle fibrosis the lack of flexibility in the muscle, that kind of like restrain the laryngeal elevation. Epiglottis might not be retroflexing, the, the flap that protect the airway, but don't forget, we have three protectors in the airway. So we have got our false vocal fold, we have got our true vocal fold. So just now the VFS, if you, if you recall back, or maybe you can play back after our live, huh, because the video will be there, okay? What happened is that, the patient is actually making full use of the full, uh, the, the true vocal fold to protect the airway. So you know what it is, uh, it's a super supracotic maneuver. And then at the same time, you have to train it so well that the patient can actually coordinate between the, the fluid flush, everything, so that the, the water won't enter the airway so much or try to prevent it from entering. So laryngeal elevation, if we, we think that, um, we think that it's due to muscle fibrosis, even if you perform the c tie exercise or shake exercise, it might not help that much. So why not focus on compensating? We see what else can we do based on the preserve function, the remaining functions, and we try to work from there. I think that that will help better. I hope this answers your question. Okay, any more questions? All right, thank you, Siyi. Um, a question from Stephanie. Um, okay. She has a patient with MPC prior and recently suffered a brainstem stroke, resulting in complete paralysis. What type of exercises or approach can you recommend? Well, uh, I suppose medical condition is a very hard for me to decide because end of the day is that you have to remember NPC prior meaning that we need to get a lot of medical history. Whether before the brainstem stroke itself, were there any swallowing difficulties even if let's say prior there was already mild right then we have to consider now the brain stem stroke itself what kind of brain stem stroke pontine midbrain or lateral medullary different type if lateral medullary it caused very significant coordination issue if let's say coupled with like an existing swallowing difficulty i can say that it's going to turn into a very severe swallowing difficulties so um not easy for me to answer this question now. Complete paralysis. Uh. It's not complete paralysis. Okay. Um, what approach? Do a VFS first. Understand more about, about this uh, solving condition. And also, you must, you must gather a very comprehensive history from, from the patient or the family. Whether there's any dysphagia. Then from there, then I would say that um, you try to work towards like, actually, the, all the swallowing exercises is possible. 
get from the VFS and then see one one way is to think about this is that try to think of like what function that you can work on first that potentially can bring the patient to swallow again safely. Okay, work from there. If you say complete, meaning that I presume that from mouth all the way to throat, all are affected quite significantly. So, um, not easy <laughs> to, for me to answer here. I need to understand the condition. Okay, and um, I would say that brainstem stroke, oftentimes SCMG biofeedback is quite effective. And you have to make sure that the patient know how to initiate a swallow first. Okay. Okay. Any more questions? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, due to time, I think we can only take one more question. Um, possibly, uh, can I, can I, <laughs> Jungkook, can I put you on? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Jungkook, question by Lim Gi Wee. Um, so he is say, uh, saying that he sweats a lot during the day and is it okay to put on the behind the ear hearing aid? Okay. Okay, Mr. Lim, of course you can put on the PTE. But what you need to do is you need to do work, work harder on the maintenance side. So actually there's a accessories to help you to protect this. Uh, there's one thing we call ear gear. Okay, this is actually is a it's a cloth to protect the sweat go inside your hearing hearing aids. On top of that, uh, you also can put your hearing aids into a dryer. It's either the the silica gel or also the electrical dryer. You can get all this at our Shopee or Lazada website to get it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Junko. Thank you, uh, Lim, for the question um uh we have come to uh the end of this session and i would like to thank all of our viewers for the questions and if we have not been able to answer your questions during this session we'll try to uh, get back to you um via chat or uh, we try to contact you to answer some of the questions and if you have any questions uh that you still like to ask and please uh, feel free to contact us. I think we have our uh, contact numbers and uh, WhatsApp or email that is in the above the chat box. Yeah. Mm. So that's okay, about- I've got something the... to add. Ah, hang yes, on, hang on, Mandarin. Yes. I, 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 the, the NPC support group um, president is just online chatting with me right now. He's actually encouraging if let's say there are any NPC survivor internationally who needs like kind of like some support, right? Um, Actually, he encouraged to 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 contact the Singapore NPC support group, um, and actually they they actually will, will provide support and help, and it's free. Okay, he says it's free. His name is Dave. All right. All right. Okay. So, how, so how do we how do how do our viewers get into that? Uh, Wailam? Uh, do you I'll, have? I'll the... provide more in my blog because right now I I don't have the information. So I I I just got the information from him. So I will uh, please visit my blog. I'll put all the details there. If let's say you all need some help with um, NPC um, support, then uh, you can consider uh, the Singapore NPC support group. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll indicate in my, in my, in my blog uh, together with the handouts. Okay. That's all from me. Yeah, thank you so much. And on behalf of 20DB uh, and Speech Therapy Works Singapore, I'd like to thank uh, Wailam and Junko and all our viewers today for spending the time together. It's been very informative and very encouraging to see so many uh, with us today. So uh, with this, thank you everyone. Uh, say good night. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Yep. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Bye. Yeah.